But if we're not careful, we will go through life. And instead of enjoying what God has blessed us with, instead of enjoying the purpose that God has given us in this walk as we follow Jesus, instead of seeing all that we have, all the potential that God has placed in our life, we can live with fear and dread and doubt of all the things that could go wrong and may go wrong and might go wrong. And God might not have thought about this and God may not have planned for this. And where are you, God? And if we aren't careful, we will let doubt rob us of this very life. So this morning, I want to talk to you about how we can let go of doubt. See, Mary and Joseph, when they heard the word from the angels, like us, because they were human, I'm sure they were very tempted to doubt what they were told, to doubt what they were seeing. I think a lot of us have seen something or have been in a place, maybe when you got saved, do you remember that feeling when God placed it on your heart, like it was clear, like I need to follow Jesus, I need to commit my life to God, and then what happened a few weeks later, the devil told you, man, you didn't mean that, that wasn't real, you didn't believe that, you didn't hear that, you didn't see that, that wasn't real. If we aren't careful, we can let doubt rob us of the very things we know to be true. And so when this angel appears to Mary, in the words that he says to her in Luke chapter 1, he's encouraging her not to let doubt, not to let fear, to rob her of this blessing, of this joy. Read with me in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. All the places he could have gone, all the places God could have sent him, to the royalty in Jerusalem, to the rulers in Rome. But he went to Nazareth. This morning, I don't want you to ever look down on your past. I don't want you to ever look down on where you were born, on your life, on your education. I want you to understand God loves using everyday normal people. A fisherman named Peter was not who the synagogue would have chosen to proclaim the gospel. And yet that's who Jesus chose to use. Even when he denied him three times and everyone would have said, don't use that guy. That's who Jesus wanted to use. That angel went to Nazareth, verse 27, to a virgin. Now we know the story of a virgin birth and we think it's something special, but I want to remind you that 2,000 years ago a virgin meant she wasn't married, she was young, and to most people she was a nobody. She was just another teenage kid. She was just a somebody that they saw walking down the street. She had no power, she had no authority, had no real ability to even speak up for herself in that culture. A virgin who was engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Verse 28, he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one. I know you don't think you are. I know you may wonder if you have God's favor. The Lord is with you. Sometimes it takes someone else telling us what we know to be true for us to believe it. Sometimes it takes someone else telling us what we need to hear for us to listen. He goes on, verse 29, but she was greatly troubled at the saying. Look, y'all, as soon as she heard it, there was a problem. She said, what am I seeing? What is this angel coming to me? Well, this can't be good. What's going on? She was perplexed. She was troubled. And it began to stress her out, to worry her. She was troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Isn't that how we often act? We're afraid to get close to God because we're afraid if we get close to God, it's going to be bad news. God's there to harm us. God has bad plans for us. We don't want to embrace his plans because his plans are worse than our plans. He, ha he means to do harm. He wants to take away. He, is not in he does not have our best interest at heart. She's just like us, y'all. She's human. She's afraid. Verse 30. And the angel of the Lord said to her, do not be afraid. Don't let fear creep in, Mary. For you have found favor with God. Verse 31. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Verse 32. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom... There will be no end. This is good news, but notice what Mary says, verse 34. Mary said to the angel, how? How can this be since I'm a virgin? Like, I, I want to believe what you're saying, angel. I want to do what you've said. I want to see this come to pass. But there's some problems in your story. I'm a virgin, verse 35. And the angel answered her, 
He said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Verse 36, he gives her a sign. He says, look, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age is also conceived. Like, look, Mary, this is nothing we can't handle up in heaven, all right? We've been working out miracles from the beginning. She has conceived a son in this sixth month with, with her who was called barren. She's been barren her whole life. God's already put some signs in place. This is not something that we just decided up in heaven would be a good idea. We've been foretelling this through prophets and through prophecy and through the scriptures for hundreds of years. This is not a last minute decision, Mary. This is something we've always been building toward. This is something Isaiah wrote about. This is something you should have known would happen and you have been chosen to be that virgin. You have been chosen to bring him into the world. Verse 37, and this is so good, for nothing Nothing is impossible. Your, your cousin Elizabeth having a baby, that's not impossible. You bringing a son into the world, a virgin, that is not impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. He says, we've been planning for this since Genesis chapter 3, when mankind was separated from God, from his relationship, not only with God. Guys, sin cost us our relationship with God, but also our relationship with others. Ever since Genesis chapter 3, we have struggled to get along. Husband and wife have struggled to get along. Man and man have struggled to get along. Father and son have struggled to get along. Like our relationships have been broken. Mary, this is good news. He's coming not just to restore the throne of David, not just to rescue his people Israel, but to change mankind and to restore the relationship with God that we need and the relationship with others that we desire. This is good news. And I want you to notice Mary's response. At first, she was perplexed. Then she said, how? She's like, I'm fearful. I'm doubtful. Now she's like, I don't even know how this is going to work. But I want you to notice how she responds in verse 38, because this is where the Christmas story gets good. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. I am here to do whatever he said. Let it be. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She didn't say, I'll figure it out. She didn't say, show me where to go. She didn't say, I need all the details now. She didn't say, tell me what's going to happen next. She said, that's cool. That's good. I'm a servant of the Lord. Let it be. And I am here to see it through. This morning, some of us want God to lay out all the plans. We want to see all the details. We want to know how much this is going to cost up front. We want to know what it's going to look like in 20 years. And God says, I want you to trust me enough right now to let go of doubt and say, here I am. Let it be so. I am your servant. I'm here to follow you. And that's what Mary did. So let's talk about how we can do that. Because here's the truth. Me, if I had that dream, and an angel showed up, I'd wake up and say, whew, I must have had quite the meal last night. There's no way that's true. There's no way that's real. Even if I argued back with the angel and I woke up and I was, I was like, no, I don't know about that. I'm going to need some confirmation. And by the way, I want you to remember that when Joseph had it in his mind to put her away, the angel said, do not do that. Why? He had had a dream and she had had a dream. You know what is incredible for your faith? When you surround yourself with believers. Not only believers, you need to be in the world, but not of the world. But hear me, you need to be around Christians. You need to be encouraged by Christians. Some of, some of us don't go to church for six weeks and we wonder why we're dealing with doubt. Because we're not around other believers who are encouraging us and saying, God is doing the same thing in my heart. God has been speaking to my life. That verse has been encouraging to me. When Joseph and Mary got back together, could you imagine the conversation they got to have? You had a dream too? My dream went like this. Was it an angel? It was an angel. And what did he say? He said the same thing to me. Can you imagine the conversation? Information in their hearts. When they, I'm sure, were doubtful when they open their eyes and then they get together and they say, You had the same. Whoa, there's something to this, guys. When I have struggled in my faith, when I have struggled with doubt, when I have struggled with fear, there's nothing better than getting together with another believer. This week I had the opportunity to get lunch with a pastor friend of mine and he sat across the table from me and man, he just shot straight. He was like, I don't want to hear about the church. I don't want to hear about how many numbers. I don't want to hear, I want to hear how you are doing. And man, we just talked and it was so good for him to speak into my soul. Why? Because I needed to hear what he had to say. He knows what I'm going through. He knows where I've been. He's a pastor. He's been a pastor for years. Guys, some of us need to get around other Christians who are going through what we're going through for that encouragement. Mary and Joseph are about to go through the same thing, but they got each other. They got each other. So I want y'all to see a couple things that the angel says. Do not doubt these things. Number one, the angel said, don't doubt God's favor. And I want you to hear me this morning. Some of us have this same problem that Mary did. We begin to doubt God's favor. We look at God and we say, God, you are holy. And he is. We say, God, you are just. And he is. And we see how sinful we are. And we say, God, you couldn't want me. And he does. 
You say, God, you couldn't use me. He will. We say, God, you surely you don't want to bless my life. You don't want to use me like you use other people. Surely, surely I can't. Mary, look at y'all. She's a virgin. To most people in that culture, she's a nobody, and that's who God chooses to use. She wasn't wealthy. She wasn't powerful. She was just another teenage girl. This morning, some of us struggle in this area of God's favor. So I want you to read with me verse 28, what the angel says. He said to her, greetings, O favored one. All right. He said, the Lord is with you. These are two things that we doubt, that God wants to bless us, that God wants to use us. And I don't mean in a shallow way. When you hear the word bless, some of y'all are like money. That's the American view of blessing. There's so much more of blessing than just getting money, y'all. I have been to churches around the world where people are blessed and they love Jesus and they don't have as much as us and they're happier than us. Some of us need some blessings that aren't financial, but it can be that, that can be part of it, absolutely. But the disciples that followed Jesus, they had a new life that wasn't based on money. Many of them were wealthy before and they found new life in something that meant something, not that made money, all right? He said, greetings, O favor one, the Lord is with you. Two things we doubt often, that God has our best interest at heart and that he's with us. The moment something happens, where are you, God? What's up? And he's like, I'm right here, where I've always been. I've been with you the whole time. I want to see you through this. I don't want to take away the problem. I want to help you understand. We can get through anything together. I want you to see that you're stronger than you think. I want you to see that you can overcome doubt. I want you to see there's nothing to be afraid of. And yet we say, God, where are you? But he goes on. She was greatly troubled. All right. At first she's, she's troubled. She's perplexed at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. She's like, what's going on? How's this going to work? Verse 30. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Okay. Mary, you have found favor with God. He uses the word twice for emphasis. I want you to hear me this morning. Some of us are afraid to, to really believe that we have found favor with God. We are God's children. He loves us dearly. And Jesus said, if you Pharisees know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more so does your heavenly Father know how to give good gifts to his kids? The problem is many of us have a distorted and warped view of God. And I had this growing up. I viewed God as an angry God, a mean God, just out to get me God, a judgmental God. And God is just. And God does judge, but he loves us. When I gave my life to Jesus, look, God doesn't see my sin, my fault. He sees a son. When he looks at you, he sees a daughter, and he loves us. But some of us have a struggle when we, in believing that like God wants what's best for us and that God wants the very best for us because we're his sons and we're his daughters. And he says to Mary, you are favored. You have found favor. He says it over and over. Why? Because we struggle to believe it. This morning, if anybody should understand favor, it should be us in this room. Can I just talk to us for a minute? Guys, we're in the wealthiest nation in the world. You didn't choose to be born now. You were born now. You didn't choose to be born here. You were born here. We have opportunities here. And I understand that some of us have some disadvantages in this room. Not all of us were born and were able to go to college. Not all of us had parents that stayed together. I understand that completely. But hear me out. We have more than any other Christian generation has ever had. 2,000 years ago, all they had was the Old Testament and what people were saying about Jesus. That's it. Now, we have the Old Testament, the New Testament, and 2,000 years of church history that backs up what we saw. Jesus wasn't just some other dude teaching. Human history changed 2,000 years ago. The calendar reflects it. Something radical happened, and the church revolutionized the world, spread throughout the world, and didn't just reach people far from God. There were people getting saved, and then they re they Look, they realigned themselves to be a blessing to the community. They were not just caring for the sick. They began starting hospitals. We were, and we are part of something that is so much bigger than just a faith movement. It's a faith movement that leads to action, that leads to life change and leads to blessing a community. When a church comes in, it should not just be people start getting saved. People start getting saved, and they begin blessing their community, and they begin feeling a need and a calling to care for the widow, the orphan, the sick, because that's what Jesus calls us to. And I'm telling you this morning, Jesus' church is still doing that today. We're a part of that. But if we aren't careful, we'll say, oh, no, culture doesn't like us. We don't have any favor. Guys, culture never likes anybody. It's always changing its mind about who it likes. People it worshipped 20 years ago, now it, it's canceled them. God said, look, you found favor on my side. I love you. I care for you. And here's the thing. It's not anything you've done. So there's none of us in the room that are like, yeah, yeah, I found favor. Favor found, favor found you. You hear me? And here's the deal. God wants to use you to help favor find more people. 
And he doesn't just talk about favor, because he knows that's not the only thing we doubt. Number one, don't doubt God's favor. Number two, quickly, don't doubt God's plan. What does she start doing? Verse 34, Mary said, how will this be? Since I'm a virgin, I don't know if you heard, but this only happens one way around here. We ain't going to, I'm not going to get into the details, Mr. Angel, but there's only one way we bring forth children around here, and I haven't done that yet. And he says, girl, listen to me. I think we can figure this out. Verse 35, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. There will be a child born, will be called the Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, we've already worked this out. Like, we know how to fix things like this. Your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son and is the sixth month with her who is called barren. Verse 37, nothing's impossible with God. Some of us in the room, we believe, we, we trust in God's favor. We absolutely believe he's with us, but we doubt the way he decides to do things. He starts allowing things to happen in our life, and he starts bringing us to places where we're making decisions. And we say, God, I don't know if you're paying attention, but I can't do that. I won't do that. It shouldn't look that way. I don't want it to go this way. God, I have a different plan. I want to follow you. I definitely want to get into heaven. I want to avoid hell, but God, I got another plan that I want to go down, and it's just like last week we talked about. It's just Joseph had this whole thing figured out what he wanted to do with his life, and God said, I got something different for you. Mary, her thing wasn't the plan. It was the details. Like, how is this going to work? And that's where a lot of us are at. God, I want you to show me exactly what I'm signing up for first. I want you to show me what it's going to look like. I want you to show me all the details. What is this going to look like? And God says, I want you to trust me. I want you to follow me. Now I know that I'm preaching to y'all, and that's why I want to turn the corner. It's really easy for me to be like, don't y'all doubt your favor. Don't y'all doubt God's plan. And what every one of you say, <laughs> how? We don't want to, but how do we stop doubting God's favor? How do we stop doubting God's plan? I'm going to share with you really quickly what we see Mary do and how it works for us. We let go of doubt. Here's how. We let go of doubt when we let go of control. That's what Mary had to do. See, the angel wasn't asking, but at the same time, there had to be some submission here. You feel me? There had to be a point where Mary said, okay. Now she's been faithful. She's honored God to this point in her life. But make no mistake about it. God's chosen her. And now she's got a real decision to make. Do I want to go down this path? There's going to be ridicule. There's going to be even some shame. What is this going to look like? I want you to see, you know the verse, verse 38, where she surrendered control. And Mary said, behold, I'm a servant of the Lord, not the other way around. Some of us treat God like a servant. God, get me this, God, fix this, God, do this, God, ha and then let me into heaven, and I'll talk to you then. That's, that's what we do. We treat him like a butler. Bring me what I need, get me where I need to go, and I'll talk to you later. That's much more interested in a relationship, but notice what she says. She says, I'm a servant of the Lord. Let it be. Let it be to me. I want you to understand, let it be is one thing. Let it be to me. Mary knows some things are going to be done to her. Some things are going to be said about her. She's going to watch her son. He's going to die on a cross. She may not know the details of the cross yet, but she knows what she's signing up for. It's going to be rough. But she also knows the blessing to her people, to the world, to every one of us this morning, it's at stake. And the angel departed from her. The angel was there for that. He was there to give her the information and then make sure she was committed. And he left. No more details. She let go of control. I'm going to tell you the hardest part about following Jesus is letting go of control. Because in 2019, in America, we value control. We want to have every detail laid out for us. We want to know where every cent of our 401k is invested. We have video cameras in every corner of our house. We have location sharing turned on with our kids and our spouses so we know where they are, when they are. We have never had more control than our fingertips, and yet we've never felt more out of you would think all this information, all this data we now have would make us feel more like, oh, we're sure. Understand this. We've never had more financial data than we do right now. We know more about the stock markets than ever before. We know how things work. We know how many employees. Like, we know all the data about these companies. So you would think investors would be like, okay. 
we feel a little better than we did 25 years ago, 30 years ago. We're not as, we're not as skeptical or we're not as fearful. And yet one little thing goes wrong and people lose their minds because the same fear that gripped us 25 years ago still grips our heart. All this control we think we have, we don't have. And so God is asking you the same question he asked Mary. You have my favor. If you don't believe that, you need to. He sent his son to die for you. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God, I want you to hear me. You've got favor this morning because you found your way into a place where you've heard the gospel. You have people around you who would love nothing more than to share with you how Jesus can change your life. You've got favor this morning. God's here. Where two or three are gathered and there's more than a few gathered this morning, God's here. He loves you dearly. He wants to know, you, you've got my favor, you've got my presence. Are you willing, though, to let go of doubt and ultimately to let go of control? Because this is what salvation is. Give me two minutes and I'll give you the salvation plan and we'll pray. Salvation is not me saying, God, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. So what I've been told is I need to say these words. Jesus is the Son of God, and I believe that because I want to go to heaven. And I believe he came and died on the cross and rose again. Whether or not it happened, I need to say that so that I can get into heaven. And I want you to change me. I may not change, but I want to say that so that I can get into heaven. Amen, God. I'm looking forward to this relationship. That's not what salvation looks like. You know what salvation is? It's saying, God, I, I believe you sent Jesus. He died and he rose. But he didn't just die and rose so we could all go to heaven. He died and rose so that we could understand not only eternal life, but what life is all about here. He died and rose, and then he called us to die to ourselves and to take up the cross and to essentially see that life isn't all about us. And that's the real sacrifice of salvation. Coming to a point where you say, I'm not the Lord of my life. I'm not the one who makes all the decisions. I trust God with my soul, but I also trust him with my life, with my finances, with my marriage, with my kids, with my everything. And I'm willing to follow you, God, and I'm willing to let go of control. And here's what that looks like. If your word says don't do it, I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to screw up from time to time and I'm going to give in, but I'm going to do my best not to do what you say not to do. And I'm going to do my best to do the things that I don't want to do, that you call me to. Like evangelizing, witnessing, sharing the good news, caring for people that don't care about me, turning the cheek on my enemies, loving my enemies, praying for my enemies. I'm going to do those things because you've called me to them and I've given over the keys. I've handed over control. A bunch of us have prayed prayers through the years, but when we truly surrender control, that's what salvation is all about. Saying, God, I'm yours. It's your plan, not mine. I'm here. I'm ready to follow you. And here's the truth. A lot of us are afraid to do that because we're afraid God's going to send us to the mission field. God doesn't call and send everybody to be missionaries, but he equips us to be missionaries right where we are. God doesn't need you to quit your job. God's already got a mission field all around you of people who are broken and hurting and need the gospel and need a Jesus follower at the desk next to them. But some of us have this idea that if we commit to following Jesus, he's going to move us to China. He's going to move us to Africa. He might, but he's not going to call you to do that until you begin using your gifts right where you are. So my question to you is really simple. Are you willing to let go of control? Are you willing to say, God, I will follow you no matter where you take me, whatever it looks like? For some of you, it's really easy. It's this first one. We talked about it already this morning. It's baptism. Oh, we want to go to heaven, and we want to get saved, but go in public with our faith? We're like, well, that, that's, a little, that's a little too far. This is the very first thing Jesus asked of us. I have Christians come to me all the time, Pastor Mark, how can I grow? And I hate how this sounds, but I ask them, have you done the very first things Jesus called us to? They say, what do you mean? I said, like right after people got saved in Acts, they got baptized. It was like step one. So if you're reading your Bible, man, you're coming to church and you're going to a group and you're wondering why you're I'm just telling you because you're being disobedient on the very first thing. It's just, it's just that simple. This, baptism doesn't save you just like this wedding ring doesn't make you married. But if I take this wedding ring off and keep it off for a while and don't wear it, my wife's going to be like, hey, what's up? Mm. I'm not saying I'm leaving you, but like, why aren't you wearing that ring? You know what I'm saying? So when we say, God, I love you. I want to be in your group. I want to be in the church. I want to be involved. And he's like, hey, what's up? <laughs> why aren't you letting everybody know you're mine? That's just what it is. 
For some of you, you've already gotten past that. You, you've let go of control on that, but like, you're like, God, I, I want to be a Christian, but like, I want to be like a nominal Christian. God's like, I want you to let go of control. I want you to follow me completely. I want you to give every decision over to me. I want you to allow me to lead you. And it may be away from that job. It may be away from that place. It may be away from that relationship. It may be away from things that are hurting you and killing you and crushing you. Things you already know are wrong, but you're hiding. Like, I may call you to confession and to, to find help and to help somebody who can help you through this thing. And you're like, whoa, 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 God, I don't know. I don't want to let, what is that going to look like? And God says, I want you to turn the keys over. And I want you to trust me. There's not an issue you're facing this morning that God hasn't already addressed. And, and, and the issue is we just don't trust his way of doing it. Say, God, I know what you said about confessing one to another and how that'll probably bring healing into my life, but I, I'd prefer to keep this private. And he says, well, then you go on, keep struggling privately. That's what he does. So I'm just asking you real quick, this morning, are you willing to let go of control?